Good morning. Good to see all of you here today. I am excited to be here today. Happy New Year. It's the first Sunday of the new year. And uh, I'm excited to um, go through this year with all of you. Really, um, it doesn't actually mean a whole lot to start a new year, right? Some of you are thinking, no, oh no, you didn't. You didn't uh, talk about how, uh, how the new year doesn't mean anything. Uh, but really, it does. And it's a good thing that we have a new year. I've come to realize that our lives are actually much like the cycle of the years. And maybe even our spiritual lives are much the same as the cycle of the new years. There are times where we get tired, where we need a restart. And actually in my life I've had a series of restarts. And so in that way, the, the, the way the calendar even works, that can have meaning to us in our spiritual lives. This year, my goal for our church family is that we will grow, not necessarily in numbers, but in depth, in maturity, in God's Word, in love for each other, in love for others. That's my ultimate goal. And as I was reading this week, I was, I was preparing uh, to speak from Ephesians chapter 4. I actually went just before the passage that we're going to go through today. And there's a really good passage of Scripture that, that has kind of become, for me, my goal for us as a congregation. And this is what it says, Ephesians 4, starting at verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does, it, does its work. Isn't that a good passage for a, a year where we want to mature, where we, we together want to grow? I think that's a wonderful, wonderful passage to live by. We're going to be starting a new series today on relationships. Whew. It's a tough one to navigate. And it's one of those things that I think probably none of us would say that we are experts on. I feel very inadequate to speak on proper relationships. But that's the beauty of what we do here. We look into God's Word. I don't have to claim to have it all together. But I do know where I can find the answers. Yes, I hope that that my life can be an example of this. But my hope is that that we can actually grow together in this. And as we go through this, you'll always be given the portion of Scripture to go ahead and read the week before. And I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to read through these passages. Because I believe that this series is about building the body together. It's about building up together. Not just me telling you this is how you should live. Because, boy, often I don't. I struggle to live like that. We're going to be going through a portion of Scripture in Ephesians that is probably one of the most practical places in all of Scripture. Some of the the, the easiest um, to see exactly how Paul expects us to live. Ephesians chapter 4 through chapter 6. He's writing to the Gentiles... In Ephesus, 
These are Gentile believers. Uh, Ephesus was a port city. It was a city where it was kind of the, the hub of activity. It was a very important city. It was the crossroads of some pretty important trade routes. It was the third largest city in the area at the time, in the Roman Empire. Paul uses this letter to really come down to the foundations of the Christian faith. And he does that mainly in the first half, which we aren't going to look at. But the first half is mostly theology, mostly this is what the gospel is. And then it becomes very practical, and that's what we're going to look at in the next little bit. And it gives a lot of teaching on how that gospel, and it's similar to what we've, what we've gone through. I, I think that it's actually a good continuation of our series on worship, because the gospel informs us how we need to live. But the foundation for Paul is always the gospel. It is always Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It always comes back down to that. And this is very important for us to understand in our hearts and in our minds as we go into this. Our living comes from what we believe. Our Christian living comes from what we believe about Christ. It comes from our thinking on this. It comes from our theology. And really all of our behavior has its roots in that. Ultimately, as Christians, believers in the death and resurrection of Jesus, our behavior, how we, re how we live, comes from how we view that event. It comes from what we believe to be true about ourselves and about God and about Jesus. And that, for Christians, always goes back to the cross. That central event in Christian history. So, Let's get into it. This thing is uh, not working. It's on here, but I th I'm wondering if we need to unplug the... We won't worry about that right now. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and look into your word. We thank you for your word. May it speak to us. May we come to clarity and understanding, especially as, as it relates to relationships. And I pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would interpret this passage for us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there is anything that comes from me that is not of your word, that it would be forgotten. I thank you so much for the opportunity to read your words. And I pray that we would be open, that our hearts would be open and soft for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 17. Like I said, we've looked at, or in Ephesians, Paul's looked at a lot of theology. This is kind of the hinge of this whole, of this whole uh, argument, his whole letter. It says this, starting at verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body, in your anger, do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let, e let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, and that, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I don't know if I ever told you, but at one time, about six years ago, I worked in a pig barn in Canada. It was an interesting experience. We were on a three-month sabbatical at the time, and the deal that we had with the farmer was that he would give us a house to stay in if we would look after his barn. The job was not a great job, but it paid for rent, and so it was an amazing deal. There were many things that I experienced for the first time at this barn. One of these things was the nature that's been built into pigs. They're ignorant. They're quite foolish. You see, there's a pit that their waste goes into. Some of you are thinking, boy, this is not a great start to this message. Just bear with me. There's a pit that their waste goes into. Uh, it's a shallow pit, about a foot deep, maybe a little bit deeper. But that pit had stoppers, much like bathtubs do. And so uh, the, what would happen is when you would unplug the stopper, then the first pit would empty into a, another pit. And from there, then the farmer could dispose of the waste when he had time. Um, and so every couple of days, I would go and I would unplug these stoppers. And I would allow the waste in the foot-deep pit to empty into the larger pit underneath. Now the thing that I needed to be careful with was that the pigs loved the smell of the fumes that came from the pit below. Immediately when the stopper was removed, there was a strong smell that would come up through that. And the pigs loved that smell. And so they loved it so much that they would actually stay there until their brains were completely fried and they would collapse over the hole. And that's what I needed to be careful of. This is what my uh, boss said. You need to be careful with this. Do not leave that stopper unstopped for too long. And then he warned me even further. He said, if you leave it unstopped for too long, then when the fans go on, it will start circulating that air, and you could actually lose the entire flock. Flock, I don't know if that... Herd, whatever. The entire barn, all the pigs would drop dead. Okay, <laughs> yikes. And then he went even further, and he said, if you walk in there at that time, you could also be a victim of the fumes. Yikes. And so th th this happened once. Whew. I opened the plug and I left it open for one minute too long. And there was a big, large, I don't even know how big this pig was. It was very big. And it went over this hole, and it collapsed right on top of the hole. And now I had to run and get the puller and pull that thing off. Meanwhile, the fumes are coming in, and I'm thinking, this is my last day on this planet. It was rough. I managed to get this pig off, and I managed to shut the hole before anything more happened. But boy, was I sweating. 
I was mad at that pig. I was very mad at that pig. Did I mention that pigs are ignorant? They're foolish. Pigs love the smell of their own waste. That's the problem. Pigs act like pigs, and this is their nature. Pigs believe the smell of their waste is the ultimate, and it kills them. If only someone would help them understand and realize that that smell is what kills them. If only someone could make a pig not act like a pig. Enter Paul. He describes the Gentiles. And look at how he describes them. Verse 17, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. Isn't that a great way of looking at pigs' desire to smell their own waste? They're darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity. Isn't that another good phrase that describes this exactly? You lose your sensitivity to even what happens. They've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they're full of greed. That's not a very good picture to start off with, isn't it? Hi, yay, yay. It's amazing how much that sounds like those pigs. Basically, Paul is saying, you are no longer considered Gentiles. You're something else. And that's a very important distinction for us to make in our life. You were like this, but you aren't anymore. Now, this is speaking to Christians. And so, uh, this is who you were, but now you are something else. Paul uses the term Gentile. Really, this was a category of those who were not of Jewish heritage. It, it was si similar to uh, nationality. And Paul says, you used to be Gentiles, a people group that was cut off from God's people. You weren't Jews. You used to live in such a way that separated you from the life God had for you. You, you were ignorant of God's plan to bring you into his citizenship with him. Your heart was hard. You wanted to do things the way it would build you up. And that thinking made you lose all moral sensitivity. You gave yourself over to indulge in every kind of thing that would fulfill your self-centered desires. Because what you believed about yourself was that existence was about you. With money and with sex. This is, this is what you as ignorant Gentiles did. Because it was about your pleasure, your kingdom. Like the pig, you sniffed around at the wrong places. You were heading toward what Paul later says, corruption. A fried brain. Because of your deceitful desires. So Paul paints us this picture of the person that is before Christ. But he says, that's not the way of life you learned. And that's where we continue. That's not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Now, just, just a, a side note here. That old self, and, and later it's going to talk about new self. It's translated differently in different places. And I think we get a little bit of a picture if we look at the other translations. The NIV and the ESV say the old and new self. The New King James translates it as the old and new man. The old and new human. Whatever the case is, something has happened that changes our very identity. In this case, the Ephesians used to be Gentiles, the old human, the old self, the old nature... But now, after putting faith in Christ, they are new humans, new man, new selves, having a new nature. So we are no longer 
what we were. And that's important for us to note. Because when we, when we um, learn our new identity, that's when actually our behavior can change. And that's what Paul argues. Our, our identity changes, then we are no longer old humans, but new humans. Paul puts this, he, he kind of illustrates it for us in, three, in a three-step process. Starting at verse 22, we already read that. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To take off. To take off your old self. To take off the old man. So the first step is to take off the old self. You were taught to put it off. To take it off, almost like clothes, was the illustration that he has. You were taught that you are no longer Gentiles, but you're citizens with God's people. So take off that previous identity. Galatians t- says it this way in 3 verse 28. You are no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's stop with the other distinctions. You put those distinctions behind you. More importantly, you put that way of life behind you. You took it off, the old self. You realized that it was corrupting you. And so maybe the best way of seeing this uh, or of thinking on this is you're no longer a Gentile. This This does not describe you anymore. How we view ourselves makes a difference in how we behave. That is clear. And so then let's take off those clothes. Let's take off that identity. That's the first thing that we do when we come to faith in Christ. And, and, and really the cross has this unbelievable um, ability to show us how messed up we are, right? How corrupt we are. We're so messed up and it required the ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb. He had to die for us. Man, we're, we're messed up. And that's painful for us to see. When we put our faith in Christ, we take that sinfulness and we say, God, I'm messed up and I need help. Why would we want to go put those clothes back on? Right? Why would we want to put on those messed up clothes again? And that's Paul's argument in many of his letters. They've been destroyed by Christ. They're filthy. They corrupt us. They're deceitful. Let's take those off. That's the first step. Second part of this way that you were taught. Ephesians 4, verse 23. To be made new in the attitude of your minds. This sounds similar to Romans chapter 12. It talks about the renewing of our minds. And I believe this is for many of us, this is a hard thing for us to do. But it's an important step. Because if we don't renew our minds, then we'll have the very real danger of thinking like our old selves. So what attitude is this? Well, Philippians talks about the attitude of Christ, right? That we should put on the attitude of Christ. And then it talks about him giving himself up for us. It's not about me. The Gentile way of thinking was what? It's about my indulgence. It's about what I do for myself. But the the, the new way of thinking, the new way of thinking is not about indulgence. It's not about me. And we change the attitude of our minds. That's not me anymore. My identity is not in the old way of life. It's not whatever I can do for me. Earl Nightingale coined the famous phrase, we become what we think about. I know it's kind of uh, one of those popular psychology type things. But research would actually say that that's true. And my experience would say that that's true. We become what we think about. Have you ever seen how kids respond to harsh criticism? 
When one kid calls their younger sibling a brat, oh, you better be believe that the rest of that day, <laughs> that kid is going to be the brattiest kid in the world. I'm going to make sure that she knows that I truly am a brat. Have any of you had that experience? The more we start to believe what others say about us, the more we allow that to define us. When I was in school, I was called fat many times. What did, what did I start to think about myself? That I was defined by my weight. That that is who I truly was. What I started to think about began to become my identity. In relation to our sin, have any of you ever felt like you were an addict? I am defined by my sin. I am defined by it. I'm a drug addict. I'm a, I'm a porn addict. Where you almost feel like that is plastered on your forehead. This is who I am. That's why it's so important. So important that we know that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Do you believe that you are a new creation? Do you believe what this word tells you about who you are in Christ? Thank you so much. Man, it is hot up here today. Whew. Thanks for seeing that, Melissa. We've been married for 13 years this week. And for 13 years, she has, she has seen those things. And she knows already that is not a great-looking man when he is so sweaty. Do you believe what this word tells you about who you are in Christ? You can see the ushers frantically putting up, Oh, man, we need to get a cooler in here. Yes, thank you. You will live out what you think. And so it's important that when you take off your old self, the old humanity, that you commit to being made new in the attitude of your mind. This is who we are now. And that's what Paul is saying. This is who you are now. These commands that I give you, it's just who we are. Start getting your mind around it. We live not for us, but for him and for others. And when our mind is renewed, then these clothes that we will clothe ourselves with mean so much more. These are the differences that attitude will make. And that's what he goes into. But let's keep on going, because he has another step to this. So we put off our old self, we renew our mind, and, and, and when we set our mind on Christ and what he has done for us. And then he says this, verse 24, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The new humanity was created to be like God. Us as Christians were created to be like God. And when our minds are renewed... That's when we gain the power to live as Jesus lived. That's when we gain this openness to the Holy Spirit working in us. And so how does this play out in everyday life? It's going to sound a lot easier than it is. He's not saying that, that, that you are going to get this right every time. But this is why we need to renew our minds so that this flows out of our identity in Christ. So this is what it says. He, just, he goes on to describe a whole bunch of old self and new self behaviors. When we realize what Christ has done, what God's plan is, this is the way the new humanity is created to be. So this is the way Paul describes it. Series of old man and new man statements. So let's look at verse 25. And if I can get uh, 
Henry, if you can just kind of go through these as we, uh, as we read them. This is what it says. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, lying, and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Speak the truth. This is who we are. Verse 26. In your anger... Do not sin. Do you know that ang- being angry is actually a, a good emotion to have? Because it says that there is some sort of an injustice that has happened. But it's what we do with that anger that defines it, whether it's a part of the old man or the new man. Because it says, do, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with it. We deal with it. This is who we are. Just keep on going. Verse 27 do not give the devil a foothold. Renew your mind so that, so that the devil doesn't have those thoughts to work with. Verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. That's not who we are. But must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Work ethic. This is who we are. We work, and we work so that we can be generous. Number 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Really, that that word unwholesome is rotten talk. Rotting talk. Things that will tear things to tear other people down, things that will begin to actually produce rot in the body of Christ. That's not who we are. We build each other up. And then it continues, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to work within you. Verse 31, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And then the, that's the old man, the new man, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. This is who we are. This is who we are. I believe that Paul is painting a picture of us, for us, of the old man. We don't want to go there. Look at all those old man characteristics. Man, we don't want to go there. That's not us. Why would we go back to that? It was that very thing that showed us that we needed Jesus. Showed us how messed up we were. And I believe he paints that picture and he shows us these specific things so that this can even begin to change our mind. To, to be able to recognize when the old man is rearing its ugly head and know what the new man has been created to look like. The characteristics of God are the characteristics of the new man. That's, how, that, that's who God is. I encourage you this week, read through that list again. All the characteristics of the new man, those are the characteristics of your Savior. So, let's get practical here. Really, what it boils down to is that it is about connecting with a God that has redeemed you and made you into a new human. Really, this is about an openness to Him working in your life. To Him showing you the areas that we, that we need to grow in that we need to put off. And then it's, say, it's about saying, help me to live this life out. I want to become who I already am in Christ. Isn't that kind of a weird statement? I want to become who I am in Christ. This process is about changing the way we think declaring that I am not who I once was. I have been made new. And so who are you? Who are you? It matters 
what your answer to that question is. Some of you would say, I'm impossible. I'm useless. Paul wouldn't say that. Paul would argue. He would refute that. No, Christ says that you are useful for his kingdom. Paul would say, there is hope. You are not impossible. There is hope for each one of us. Hope for maturity in Christ. Hope for growth in Christ. That is not who you are. Why else would Paul write the letters? That's not who you are. Others of you might say, I'm defined by my paycheck. If I'm rich, then I am somebody. If I'm not, then I'm nobody. Paul would say, if you are in Christ, that doesn't define you. Being in Christ defines you as a follower of Christ. Others of you would say, I'm a dirty sinner. I'm a drug addict. I'm a porn addict. I'm a gossip. Are you in Christ? Then that doesn't define you. It doesn't define you anymore. You're forgiven of that. The message of the cross is, is often so spectacular. It's so strange um, how um, everything comes together in the cross. On the one hand, it, conf it confronts our sinfulness. It says you are a sinner. But then the craziness and the clarity of it all is that the cross says you're loved. You're forgiven. And there is hope for a different way of life. Isn't that wild that it can be <laughs> almost the complete opposite is true? The invitation of Paul, the invitation of Jesus is become who you are. Follow me. Become who you are. A Christ follower. Does that happen overnight when you decide to accept what Christ says of you? No. It's through a constant, it's actually lifelong, so you'll have this for the rest of your life, that you are gonna, you're going to have to put off the old self, and put on the new self. It's through constant lifelong learning to recognize the old man in you and say, that's not who I am anymore. This is who I now am. It's a step-by-step -step declaring, I don't follow the way of the Gentiles, the way of the, the pigs. I follow God's example. Five verse 1 and 2 says this. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The very nature of Jesus is this. Putting off the old, renewing our mind, becoming more concerned with his kingdom work than ours, putting on the new self. My dad, we always had to chuckle when I was a kid. Um, often my dad would, and once again, I, I'm, I'm sorry that it's going here, but um, he would go into the bathroom and he would come out and he would open the door and he would say, I'm a new man. Isn't that a good picture? <laughs> I'm a new man. I've left that old garbage behind me. It's a little bit different than the pigs, right? I'm a new man. The Holy Spirit is there to help us recognize the ways of the old nature. He's there to continue this, this maturing and this transformation into that which we were created to be like God. In true righteousness, as verse 24 says, in true righteousness and holiness. Fully devoted followers of Jesus. Selfless, generous, encouraging, forgiving people. This is who you are. Did you know that? This is who you are. This sounds like a very, um, like, like one of those um, 
inspirational talks, right? But it's deep. This is who you are. This is who you were created to be. And when we strive to be who we are in Christ, our relationships, our families, our community, our society, it will be transformed. This is why looking at how we relate to others is so important. But this is actually the, this is the basis of it. This is who you are. And so in the next weeks, let's lean into that and let's learn who we are to be and who we are. God has the best way for our relationships. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes to the way of the old man still alive in us. Transform and renew our minds to think like you. Give us courage and strength and wisdom as we seek and strive to be who you say we are. In Jesus' name, and all those who are a new creation said, Amen.